Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number three, please. 1 Corinthians chapter three. And I want to speak to you about this morning about what is our perception of the goal. All right. And actually, this is a continuation of what I've been speaking about the last couple of weeks with the, uh, hopefully you can see this, um, with the work, work of the cross. And now we're up here at the way of the cross. And that's what we're talking about here. All right. And uh, we praise the Lord for that. So over here in 1 Corinthians chapter number three. Let me read, please, verse number 10, where it says, According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Now, keep your finger right here and come to Ephesians chapter 2, please. All right, Ephesians chapter number 2. So when I come over there and we read verse number 22, it says this, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, we notice what Paul says there in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. He says, by the grace of God, right? Verse number 10, actually according to the grace of God, we see. So what is happening here in the building of this temple that we see, uh, or building, if you want to call it that, of the body of Christ, what we see is by the grace of God, and we praise the Lord for the grace of God, don't we? I mean, how did we get saved? We generally say, I got saved by the grace of God. I believe the gospel message that was presented to me, and it was through grace, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that I came into a relationship with God. And so that, you know, it's a wonderful thing to me when you think about this. It started with grace, it's going to finish with grace, and it continues in between with grace. So it's a wonderful thing. Now, what I'd like to do is this. I want to read a, a uh, actually, it's a devotional by Paul David Tripp. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him, but my uh, sister-in-law, Marilyn, gave me this uh, devotional book, book by Mr. Tripp, oh, 10 or 15 years ago, all right? And it, it's been a blessing to me ever since. Now, he says this in, in the heading. He says, God's agenda is change. Now, what's an agenda? Okay, it's a plan. It's what we're trying to get to. And what Mr. Tripp says this, God's agenda is change. You need change. Now, remember, who's he speaking to here? Speaking to believers. All right, keep that in mind, speaking to believers. The promise of grace is change. The hope of eternity is the completion of the work of change. In other words, God is changing us, all right? So let's, let me just read this little article, then, then we'll get to the scripture here. He says here, we all tend to share in a big, bad personal problem. Oh, dear. It is one that doesn't get much press or pulpit time. Yet this problem is a huge interrupter of our personal spiritual development. If you have this problem, you won't be concerned that you have this problem precisely because you have this problem. All right, Miss Haley, would you shut that door, please? Let me read that again. If you have this problem, you won't be concerned that you have this problem precisely because you have this problem. I confess that I think. This is a big deal for me as well. The problem is personal, spiritual self-satisfaction. Personal self-satisfaction in the spiritual realm, right? The more I travel from church to church, the more I engage with leaders, and the more I have opportunities to interview people in the seats, the more I grow convinced that the true crisis in the modern evangelical church is not dissatisfaction. It's just the opposite. We're all too satisfied. We're all too satisfied with who we are, where we are, and what we're doing. We're satisfied with a little bit of biblical literacy. We're satisfied with occasional movements of ministry. We're satisfied with the manageable debt that allows us to put a few coins into the plate. 
We're satisfied that we've been married for a while, and it doesn't look like we'll break up soon. We're satisfied with a bit <coughs> of a gasp of theology of Scripture. We're satisfied with faithful attendance at the weekend services of our churches. We're satisfied with quick morning devotions. We're satisfied with a little ministry experience. We're satisfied that we don't act out most of our lusts and we don't communicate most of our envy. We're satisfied that in our disappointment with God, we don't walk away. We're satisfied that we can harness a good bit of our fear of man. We're satisfied to use most of our material resources to make and keep ourselves comfortable. Are you following all this? This is the story of life, okay? We're satisfied to be mere consumers of the work of the church rather than committed participants in it. Do we all get that one? Should I read it again? We're satisfied to be mere consumers of the work of the church rather than committed participants in it. We're satisfied with hearts that occasionally wander, with thoughts that contradict what the Bible says is good and true. We're satisfied with the amount of conflict we have in our lives. We're satisfied, he says. Okay, a little bit more. None of us is yet a grace graduate, but we're satisfied. We all give evidence that we still need to grow, but we're satisfied. And because we are satisfied, we are resistant to the grace that is our only hope. I think that's important. Because we're satisfied, we resist the grace that God's giving to us. If you are able to convince yourself that you are healthy, even though there may be indicators that you are not, you probably are not going to go to the doctor asking for his diagnostic and curative skill. But here's what you and I need to remember. We serve a dissatisfied Savior. We serve a dissatisfied Redeemer, he has. He knows we still need the transforming work of his powerful grace. Isn't it wonderful that in gracious dissatisfaction, he will not relent until every microbe of sin is removed from every cell of every one of his hearers, of the hearts of, the, uh, of his children. So basically, what is he saying? We're satisfied, but God isn't. Our Redeemer isn't. And why isn't he? He's still working in us, okay? If he was satisfied, he wouldn't have to work in us any longer. We'd be a graduate of grace, all right? Now, keep that in mind as, as, as we go through here, if you would. Come over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, remember, we're talking about the way of the cross, not the work of the cross, but the way of the cross, Okay? So in chapter 15 here, 1 Corinthians, let's notice uh, where do I want to start? Well, let's just start in verse 27. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. Now watch. Yahweh, or God, has put all things in subjection under his feet, in, under Christ's feet. Now is that future? Past, present. He has put all things under his feet. So God has already done this. So all things are under the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of those things you find, uh, well, let's back up to 23 and we'll go on down. Well, 24, all right, 23 has to do with the resurrection. 24, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies, his enemies, under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is what? It's death. Has death been abolished? <laughs> the real death has been abolished. That we're talking about the sin death has been abolished. It's a point unto man wants to die physically. That's because we're not immortal, right? 
we're not immortal. So what we're talking about here is, is a sin death that has been abolished, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, I turn the page here, it is evident that he is accepted. In other words, the Father, God the Father is accepted. He's not under the authority of his Son, right? Who put all things in subjection to him. Now, as, as you look at that and think about it for a while, you have to have a real perspective and belief about this. I have come to a place in my life, because all my life, Christian life, I've said, I believe the Word of God, every Word of God, when in fact, there is probably three or 400 verses that I didn't want anything to do with, okay, that Jesus gave, that the Father gave him. And, and, and people today still reject that. All they say, say they believe it, okay? Now, watch what it says in 28. When all things are subjected to him, are all things subjected to him? Did it say so in verse number 27? Yes, it did, okay? So when all things are subjected to him, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be what? So God may be all in all, all right? Now, Watch this. What is God's goal? Let me come back to this little chart here just, just for a minute. Remember, we had Adam up here, you know, creation, Adam. Adam fell here. Christ came into the world, all right? <clears throat> the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. We know why he came. He came to give his, his life, all right, on behalf of mankind. Now, when you become a believer, all right, the work of the cross is still within you, but the very agenda of God brings you up to this line, the original line that God had. Now we're walking in the way of the cross, see? And that's what we're talking about here, the way of the cross. Now, what I'm going to try to show you today is this, that there's two views here of the cross, and I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can illustrate this. Uh, here you have an individual, you just use a Mr. Stick figure, all right? And this is a fellow that gets saved. And when he gets saved, what's he see? Man, he sees a big cross. But as he, as he moves along in his Christian life, what happens at a cross? It gets smaller and smaller. Okay? Smaller and smaller. That's what happens. The realization of, oh, yeah, I got saved. I was there at the cross. But now, it, you know, it comes down. Now, you take the, a, a believer who is serious about what God uh, is, is doing, all right? And here's how he perceives it after his, he's maturing in the Lord, all right? He sees it little and getting bigger. This is becoming a, more of a reality to him because of the way of the cross, see? Which we'll see here in, in a minute. The work of the cross has to do with your redemption, the way the cross has to do with your life, say, and that's what we're going to look at here today. So keep that in mind. We're, we'll close with that also as, as we look at this. So how do we perceive then is what I want to say, the uh, way of the cross, okay? Now, what is God's, as far as we're concerned as believers, uh, what is his goal for us? as believers. Now we know that we're being placed, we're placed in this body, this be, uh, a habitation of God, dwelling place. We read that in Ephesians. Uh, what is the goal that God has for us? What's that? Okay, to reign with him, that's a good goal. To be like him. All right, so let's go to Romans chapter eight, please. All right, Romans chapter number eight here. And <clears throat> Let's notice verse 28 that reads like this. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, it doesn't say you're not going to go through bad things in life, does it? No, what it says is he's going to take everything and make it work toward good, say, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed, become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay? So I believe that God's ultimate goal for us 
is to be conformed into the image of our Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And, and as, you, as you look at this and you understand this, the image of his Son, and what did it say in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians and verse number 10? By this grace, Paul's saying, I'm building something, and you better pay attention on how you build, all right? So it's Paul that's revealing to us how this is uh, to take place. Uh, notice 2 Corinthians, all right? 2 Corinthians, please, in chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians 4, and let's notice verses 15 to 18 here. For all things are for your sakes. Now, what did we just read back there in <laughs> 28 and 29 of chapter 8 of Romans? All things, God makes all things work to your good, all right, ultimately to your good. So here Paul says <laughs> in 15, for all these are for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. So this grace is working to the glory of God. Make sense to you? All right. Therefore, we do not lose heart, Paul says, but though our outer man is decaying prior to the Sunday school class here this morning. Two of our dear ladies were standing and talking about what it takes to keep going as a seasoned citizen and the braces you have to wear and the drugs you got to take. <laughs> the, the outer man is what? Decaying. Yeah, <laughs> the king. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of what? Glory. Far beyond all comparison. You can't even compare us with anything that we know of today. It's an eternal weight of glory. So as we go through these things, as Brother Carl and I spent the afternoon in the distribution box for our septic system last <laughs> yesterday, okay, uh, because it was all plugged up, that was a light affliction, Carl. We didn't think so at the time, all right? But light affliction, as, as, as we see that. While we look, verse 18, not at all at the things, I'm sorry, let me start again. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are what? Not seen or unseen. Uh, you remember Colossians? I think we're going to get to that. Colossians chapter 3. Set your affections on what? But brother, then I can't see that. Yeah, you can. You're in touch with the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see it in the spiritual world. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are what? They're eternal, okay, eternal. Uh, notice right up above uh, chapter 3, please, chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. What image from glory to glory? It's Christ, see? And where do we see Christ, folks? In the scriptures and in each other as we walk as he would have us to walk, okay? So how do we perceive then or view the way of the cross? That's what this whole thing. One here, watch, this is natural right here. But down here, it's spiritual. I've often given this illustration when I was, First, a believer, I was out on visitation down in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, to a, another gentleman, and we knocked on a, a door, and a lady answered, and, and uh, uh, the fellow I was with 
uh, said, ma'am, we're from uh, Trinity Baptist Church, and we're just out inviting folks to church. Uh, do you know Christ is your personal Savior? Oh, yeah, Billy Graham saved me, she says. <laughs> you know? And she, she was at a crusade somewhere, and she heard the message, you went forward. But she didn't say, Jesus saved me. She said, Billy Graham saved me. You know? So at the moment, even to me as a young Christian, it was kind of humorous. You know? But that's how people are, okay? Yeah, I got saved at a church. I got saved, you know, this and that. Uh, it, it's the Lord that saves us. Now, let, let me do this. Let's illustrate some of this, because what I want to show you is this. As we, as we, we grow where's the marker? Over here. You know, <clears throat> Peter calls the cross a tree, all right? And all trees bud before the leaves come out, right? And if it's a fruit tree, you get, a, a, you know, a leaf and a, a fruit, all right? Now, what you're going to see is, is that uh, uh, a bud. I'll put a bud here, okay? Uh, so you'll, if you can see that, and, and remember this. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Let me give you some Bible il illustrations of what I'm talking about here, all right? See if you can follow along. In chapter 12 of Genesis, a very common and familiar verse, verses to us, first four verses here, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. Now, every one of these statements is against the society that Abraham grew up in, all right? The normal society that he grew up with. To the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, you know, you, you think about this for a while. He's going to make his name great there in verse number two, right? Why? So he can be a Babe Ruth that, that, that everybody knows or, you know, okay, he's going to make their name great, so he can be a blessing. See, he can be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, now notice, all the families of the earth will be what? Blessed. Now, Peter repeats this in Acts chapter 3 when he's, when he's preaching, okay? So Abraham went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. So what do we know? Abraham believed God. He took it to heart. And you know what happened with Abraham? A bud came up. All right? A bud came up. He was called to be a father of many nations. And actually, when you see that here in Genesis chapter 12, you have to think about Abraham actually takes the place, sort of, now, you know, of Adam. Adam was to be a picture to his progeny of his creator, of God himself, all right, in life. That's why Adam was in school with God, walking with God in the garden, learning good and evil. He just jumped the gun, as we all know on that, right? So Abraham then was to be a shadow of God on the earth. Are you sure about that? Yeah. Come on back to Galatians with me. Galatians, please. And let's notice chapter number three. I'll be there in a second. The Bible still has a lot of pages, huh? I just went by it. All right, Galatians chapter number three. And in Galatians three, notice with me, please, verse 14, where it says, in order that Christ Jesus in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, now we just read about Abraham, going to be a blessing to the families, right? That the blessing of Abraham might come to the what? To the Gentiles. 
might come to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles then are part of all the families of the earth. In fact, when Abraham was given this commission, there were no Jews, right? They were all Gentiles, if you want to look at that in, in that respect, okay? So that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now notice, part of this blessing from Abraham uh, coming to the Gentiles is that the Gentiles would receive the what? Promise of the Spirit, capital S there, the Spirit of God within them. That's part of the blessing that Abraham is to give. All right. Now let's notice. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. You become a believer, you get the spirit, right? That's what we see. Now let, let's go to the end of the chapter, verses 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Was there Jew or Greek in chapter 12 of Genesis? No. Okay. Not at all. Then you are, I'm sorry, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul's talking to all the believers here. They're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants Heirs according to what? Okay, the promise. Now, we need to understand that. Heirs, and, and where does it come from? It comes from God's promise he made to Abraham. Abraham, believe it, became a bud. Now, watch. Come back to Romans, and I think this is what I want. Romans chapter 4. Okay, Romans chapter 4. Here's 6. All right, Romans chapter... Number four, notice with me uh, verse number 11. I mean, we could read the whole chapter here, but let's, let's look at verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised. We're talking about Abraham here, okay, up to verse number three. So that he might be a what? What's it say there? father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them, and the father of, the, of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while when? Uncircumcised, okay? I come down to verse number 16. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be according uh, accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of what? Now, a lot of people want to stick this to the physical side of things. It's the faith of Abraham. The faith of Abraham has nothing to do with the physicality of somebody. We're looking at, at the spiritual side. He's the father of all that what? That believed. Whether at this time they were of the circumcision or uncircumcision, it didn't matter to God. Because in God's eyes, according to Galatians chapter 3, what did he say? There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female. All right? So what are you saying, brother? I'm saying here, this bud <laughs> that pops up because of the faith of Abraham, all right, in believing God, okay, it's going to grow. It's going to go somewhere, okay, because what's a bud become? A flower or fruit. You know, in our, in our backyard, we have an apple tree that our son Joshua bought us 25 years ago, and originally it was in the front yard, all right, and got to be about seven, eight feet tall, and then he says, we need, an, we need a maple tree. And he gets this a maple tree. Well, do you know what maple trees are? They're water hogs. Oh, yeah. They go out, their they're roots, and they, they t everything they take. All right? So we had to transplant that poor little apple tree in the backyard. Now, it's about 15, 16 foot tall, and it gives you the worst apples you ever had in your life. All right? <laughs> and, but, <laughs> but Susan, we gather them. She makes applesauce. It, it, it's good with them. All right? But every year, what happens? 
the buds come out. And what happens to an apple tree when it buds? They flower, pretty white, just beautiful, okay? And our neighbors have one right next door to us. It's, they're, they're only probably 15 feet apart, but it's a little, one of the little apples, you know? And uh, at any, any rate, when you see those two trees together, it's just beautiful. Then you wake up two days later and look out and everything's gone. They just, they just fall, okay? But the idea is this, a seed was originally planted the tree comes up, it buds to continue its, its work that God has for it, okay? Now, come to chapter 22. So we're talking about Abraham as a bud. A shadow, if you put uh, Genesis chapter 22, all right? Okay. So this bud comes out, and let's see what happens here with Abraham. Notice Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. But, but it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. Now, notice the word, circle it. Uh, I think our King James said tempted Abraham. But it's the same word. That's, a temptation is a test, okay? He tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, exclamation point, tried to get his attention. And he said, here I am. This is something important. That's why God, Abraham, you know, he said, take now your son, your only son. What was his name? But I thought he had another son by the bondwoman, but only one son by the promise, right? Now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now, what is God looking for here? Remember, it's a test. He's looking for something here. Okay. Remember, we start with a bud. And that's what all our faith is when we first get saved. It's nothing but a bud. It hasn't flourished yet. hasn't matured yet. All right. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let's go down to verses 11 and 12 here. All right. Because what did Abraham do? He got to the place. He built the altar. He arranged the wood. He bound his son and Isaac, <laughs> his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So what is he doing here? He's manifesting the very promise that God made that this Isaac, his son that he loved, will do what in the, in the future? He's going to be this. If, if Isaac isn't around, how about the, your, your, uh, your seed will be as the stars of the sky, sand of the sea? Well, if Isaac dies, what happens? God's going to renege on his promise. All right. He said, oh, I'm sorry, verse 11, but the angel Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, notice exclamation point, just like up in verse uh, number one, okay? And he said, here I am, gives the same answer. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do, not, uh, do nothing to him, for now I know that you reverence God. Your Bible might say fear in the margin. Okay, literally, it's reverence God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Why would a man do that? He had reverence for God. So what did that mean in terms of Abraham? Reverence for God. I believe the words that God spoke to me. My seed is going to continue on. Say. Hebrews 11, thank you, as, as we see that, he believed God. If it's true and he kills Isaac, then what has to happen? He has to resurrect him from the dead, all right? Resurrect him from the dead. Now, what did God know about Abraham? That Abraham believed that. And he went to the nth degree, and some people would say it's cruel, okay, just like some people don't know how to silence their phones when they come into the church building. Okay. 
Abraham understood exactly what God said. God understood the very heart of whom? Abraham. And as a result of that, watch, what was a bud now in chapter two becomes a blossom. Okay? It fully comes out as something beautiful. And what was beautiful? Abraham's relationship with the God that made a promise to him. See? He took it to heart. God understood that. In other words, Abraham had the right perspective of his walk with God, his relationship with God. And that's important. Now, let, let's notice another one. We're in Genesis. Come to chapter 25 with me. I'm going to hurry along here. Chapter 25, please. And let's notice verses 27 to 34. Now we, now we found another person. Okay. And watch what happens here. Straighten that out. Chapter 25 of Genesis, verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man, living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had tasted for game. He had a taste for game. You go to chapter 27, verse 10, you'll see where that word game is used with Rebekah and, and Jacob. Okay. But Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there. That red stuff. So, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Why is his name called Edom? Because of the red. Okay, that's what Edom means, red. But Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I am about to die. So of what use then is this birthright to me? And Jacob said, first, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, which is red back in those days. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau did what? Despised his birthright. He had a birthright that came because of the society he lived in. They understood this. But what did he do? He despised it. There wasn't even a bud that showed up in Esau's life. Not at all. He despised what God had given. That's a sad, sad situation. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19. All right. Exodus chapter 19. Now we're talking about the children of Israel have come out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They're gathered around Sinai, right? And here in Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, it says this. Now then, this is God speaking with Moses. Now then, if you will, will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession. My Bible has in the margin special treasure. You shall be my special treasure among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that shall, you shall speak to the sons of whom? Israel. So now we have another bud comes up. Okay, here's a bud. Tell the people of Israel this. Tell them what? What's it say there? You're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Okay. But as we read Exodus through Deuteronomy, what do we find? No blossom comes up. None at all. They had the wrong perception. Watch this. Come back to Psalm with me, please. Uh, and 78, Psalm 78. All right, Psalm, they had a wrong perception. There was a bud, but no blossom. Okay. Psalm 78 is one of the longer Psalms that you're going to find in Scripture. A masculine of Aesop. Okay. And notice what it says in verse 10. They did not keep the covenant of God. And notice, 
and refuse to do what? Walk in his way, okay, or his law. They refused to walk in his law. It wasn't that they didn't know what the law was and the way of God was, but they refused to do what? <coughs> walk in it, okay? Refuse. One more verse. Come to Jeremiah. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jeremiah chapter 32, please. Okay, Jeremiah 32. And let's notice verse number 23. <clears throat> where it says, they came in and took possession of it, but they did not obey your voice. You, your voice is capitalized as God's voice or walk in your law. They have done nothing at all that you commanded them to do. Therefore, you have made all this calamity come upon them. What's the calamity was coming upon Israel here at this time? Actually, Jerusalem. It was Babylon and, and Nebuchadnezzar coming down. All this happened. Why? Because they refused, see, to walk in his way. A bud, but no blossom. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 9. Okay, Acts chapter 9, I'm, I'm hurrying along here. Acts chapter number 9, now let's notice verse 15. Okay, verse 15, watch, watch the bud come out. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Now this is <clears throat> Ananias here. God speaking with him, and Ananias is to go to Paul, who's in a, in a room, right? Can't see, but what does God do? He, he gives Ananias the message. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Okay? Now, we, we mean, is that the bud? I think that is the bud, because what happens to Ananias? He goes and tells Paul. And immediately, what do we see Paul doing? Okay, I come to Philippians. He went out and declared Christ. All right, let's go to Philippians and chapter number three, please. Philippians chapter number three. Philippians three, and let's notice, please, is verses 13 to 15. Brethren, he says, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. It's talking about verse 10, okay? that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and searching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect or mature, have this attitude, and if in anything you have a different attitude, God will re reveal that also to you. So God wants to keep you on, in, in pace with what his goal is. And what's his goal for us? To be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. You know what we see there? We see someone with the right perception of what God is trying to do with believers. And so what happens? The bud back in chapter 9 of Acts has turned into a blossom. See? A blossom. Now... Let me give you one more illustration of this. Uh, come on back to 1 Corinthians 3, in case you've forgotten. Okay. And I, I read these to begin with, but 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. All right. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. Each man, each believer, right? So what do we have here? We have a bud. You follow that? Come to the verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, all right? Where it says, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit you are also being built together. That's an ongoing work, right? These folks that were a bud have submitted to this, understand what God is doing with them, 
all right? We're talking about walking in the way of the cross here. So turn over to chapter four with me, please. Chapter number four. And notice what it says here in verses one through three. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in what? In love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, for there is one body, et cetera, et cetera. But notice this. We are to, Paul is imploring these people to walk in the manner worthy of whom? The calling of which you've been called. We've been called to be conformed to the image of Christ and predestined to be called. All right. Come to chapter five with me in verse number one. Therefore, be imitators of God. Whoa. There's a verse to memorize. Therefore, be what? Of whom? As beloved children, and walk in love. Christ you and gave himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. It's so we're to, we're to walk worthy in this life, all right? And we're to be imitators of God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right? Verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Says it a couple more places. And I think we need to begin to understand that. We're to imitate the very life of God. Man, how do you do that? You don't. It's by the grace of God. When you submit to the grace of God within you, okay, you'll begin to understand what it's all about. Come over to uh, Philippians. Be my last verse here, I think. Philippians chapter number uh, one. Notice verses six and seven, where Paul says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in you. Do you believe that? Do you believe he began a good work in you? How did he do it? By grace. How does it continue? By grace. Okay. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus or Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you where? If, if, if we are in Paul's heart, I'm sure we're in the Lord's heart and in the Father's heart, are we not? Since both in my imprisonment and defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of what? Of grace with me. See? Partakers of this grace with me. I think we need to understand. So say, Brother Dan, what are you talking about? So which view are you living in? Okay. This one where the cross was huge when we got saved, but it keeps getting smaller and smaller because you're not in that relationship because you're refusing the grace of God like Esau. Esau never got a bud. Like Israel, who refused to do right. Or is this our perception? We went to the cross, praise the Lord, but the cross grows in our life. We understand. You're to be imitators of God. What's it say there uh, when we read that verse in chapter 5 of, of, of e Ephesians? Turn back there. And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice, what? To God as a fragrant aroma chapter four in a manner worthy of the calling for which you have been called with all humility i find very little of that on my our facebook page i keep saying uh, this guy believes what i believe but he sure is nasty about it let's put him in purgatory for 30 days and you can do that on facebook which means his posts won't show up anymore Okay, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. If we're to do that and we're to imitate God, how does what what's God's attitude toward us? Patience, tolerance with us. He does it in how? Praise the Lord in love. 
All right. So I hope when you see the, the, the thought about the way of the cross, where we're to be walking, you'll have that perspective that the cross is growing and the cross grows. You're going to get smaller and Christ is going to get bigger where in your life and within you. So I'm going to close there. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I do thank you for uh, the opportunity to present uh, my thoughts of your word to these dear saints. I pray you bless it now. Uh, give us understanding of what you have for us. And Father, we'll thank you for that in Christ's name and amen.